A quick new idea daily from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. Something you ate, drank, or thought about eating or drinking today probably came from our buzzy friends known as honeybees. Fruits, veggies, nuts, so much of our diet comes from the help of these honey makers. Noah Wilson-Rich is an ecologist who's ringing the alarm about their population decline over the last few decades. To solve this crisis, he's pointing to environments where they're thriving. Pollinator decline is a grand challenge in the modern world. Of the 200,000 species of pollinators, honeybees are the most well understood, partly because of our long history with them dating back 8,000 years ago to our cave drawings in what's now modern-day Spain. And yet we know that this indicator species is dying off. Last year alone, we lost 40% of all beehives in the United States. Can you imagine if we lost half of our people last year? And if those were the food-producing people, it's untenable. And I predict that in 10 years, we will lose our bees. Now, I first started keeping bees here in Cape Cod, right after I finished my doctorate in honeybee immunology, and I was on to something. I knew that I could find out how to improve bee health. And so the community on Cape Cod here in Provincetown was ripe for citizen science, people looking for ways to get involved and to help. And so we met with people in coffee shops. A wonderful woman named Natalie got eight beehives at her home in Truro, and she introduced us to her friend Valerie, who let us set up 60 beehives at an abandoned tennis court on her property. And so we started testing vaccines for bees. We were starting to look at probiotics. We called it bee yogurt ways to make bees healthier, and our citizen science project started to take off. Meanwhile, back in my apartment here, I was a bit nervous about my landlord. (laughs) I figured I should tell him what we were doing. (laughs) I must have caught him on a good day, though, because when I told him what we were doing and how we started our nonprofit urban beekeeping laboratory, he said, that's great, let's get a beehive in the back alley. (laughs) I mean, instead of getting an eviction notice, we got another data point. That beehive produced more honey that first year than we had ever experienced in any beehive we had managed. It shifted our research perspective forever. It changed our research question away from how do we save the dead and dying bees to where are bees doing best? And we started to be able to put maps together, looking at all of these citizen science beehives from people who had beehives at home decks, gardens, business rooftops. And we started to engage the public, and the more people who got these little data points, the more accurate our maps became. And so when you're sitting here thinking, how can I get involved, you might think about a story of my friend Fred, who's a commercial real estate developer, and he was thinking the same thing. He was at a meeting thinking about what he could do for tenant relations and sustainability at scale. And while he was having a tea break, he put honey into his tea and noticed on the honey jar, a message about corporate sustainability from the host company of that meeting, and it sparked an idea. He came back to his office, an email, a phone call later, and boom, we went national together. We put dozens of beehives on the rooftops of their skyscrapers across nine cities nationwide. (laughs) Nine years later, we have raised over a million dollars for bee research. We have a thousand beehives as little data points across the country, 18 states and counting, where we have created paying jobs for local beekeepers, 65 of them, to manage beehives in their own communities, to connect with people, everyday people, who are now data points, together making a difference. So in order to explain what's actually been saving bees, where they're thriving, I need to first tell you what's been killing them. The top three killers of bees are agricultural chemicals, such as pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, diseases of bees, of which there are many, and habitat loss. So what we did is we looked on our maps, and we identified areas where bees were thriving. And this was mostly in cities, we found. So we started with these three killers of bees, and we flipped it. Which of these is different in the cities? So the first one, pesticides. We partnered up with the Harvard School of Public Health, and we looked at pesticide levels, and we thought that there would be less pesticides in areas where bees are doing better. And in fact, there are the most pesticides in cities. 
we moved on. The disease hypothesis. We looked at diseases all over our, our beehives, and what we found: there's no difference between disease in bees in urban, suburban, rural areas. We're moving on. The habitat hypothesis. This said that. Areas where bees are thriving have a better habitat, more flowers, right? But we didn't know how to test this, so I had a really interesting meeting. An idea sparked with my friend and colleague Ann Madden, fellow TED speaker, and we thought about genomics, kind of like ancestry DNA or 23andMe. We developed this for honey, right? And so we have a sample of honey, and we look at all the plant DNA, and we find out I'm sumac. <laughs> And so, for the first time ever, I'm able to report to you what type of honey is from right here in our own community. Honey DNA, a genomics test. Spring honey in Provincetown is from privet. What's privet? Hedges. What's the message? Don't trim your hedges to save the bees. <laughs> right? If you have honey from Provincetown right here in the summer, you're eating water lily juice. In the fall, sumac honey. We're learning about our food for the first time ever. And now we're able to report. If you need to do any city planning, what are good things to plant? What do we know the bees are going to? That's good for your garden. For the first time ever, for any community, we now know this answer. What's more interesting for us is deeper in the data. Provincetown honey goes from 116 plants in the spring to over 200 plants in the summer. These are the numbers that we need to test the habitat hypothesis. So we're finding out now that in rural areas there are 150 plants on average in a sample of honey. That's a measure for rural. Suburban areas. What might you think? Do they have less or more plants in suburban areas with lawns that look nice for people, but they're terrible for pollinators? Suburbs have very low plant diversity. So if you have a beautiful lawn, well, good for you, but you can do more. You can have a patch of your lawn that's a wildflower meadow to diversify your habitat to improve pollinator health. Anybody can do this. Urban areas had the most habitat, best habitat, as you can see here, over 200 different plants. We have, for the first time ever, support for the habitat hypothesis. We also now know how we can work with cities. City of Boston has eight times better habitat than its nearby suburbs, and so when we work with governments, we can scale this. But what I think is even more important is when we think about natural disasters. For the first time, we now know how we can have a baseline measure of any habitat before it might be destroyed. You might even think about right here, the beautiful land that connected us, that primed us all to citizen science to begin with, the erosion, the winter storms that are getting more violent every year. What are we going to do about this? Our precious land. While looking at honey DNA, we can see what plants are good for pollinators that have deep roots. That can secure the land, and together everybody can participate. Now, together, we know what's saving bees by planting diverse habitat. Now, together, we know how bees are going to save us by being barometers for environmental health, by being blueprints, sources of information, little data factories suspended in time. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in Provincetown, Massachusetts. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx Provincetown. Want to listen to the full talk? Find Noah's talk and more at TED.com/TEDxShorts. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.